think we can get started. Uh, welcome to the Triangle Computer Science Distinguished Lecture Series. I'm pleased to introduce you Professor Ravi Sandhu today, who is our distinguished lecturer today. I think for people who are working in the security community, Ravi does not need any introduction. So, but for the benefit of our student, I'd like to give you a few highlights uh, of the things that Ravi has done. Actually, friends told me to keep it brief so we have more time for our speaker. I'll just few, mention a few things. You know, Ravi has done some seminal work on role-based access control, which is actually has greatly influenced the standard uh, you know, formed by NIST and being used by many products. I think many of our professors and students are going to ACM CTS, ACM Conference on Computer and Communication Security, and Ravi founded that conference. And uh, many of us are publishing in ACM transactions in information system uh, security, and Ravi again is the founding editor-in-chief. And Ravi also is the editor-in-chief for HRV transactions on uh, distributed, you know, dependable and secure computing. So over the years, Ravi has done a lot of very impressive things and has been very influential in the security community. So today I'm very pleased to have him to talk about the recent thing he has been doing. So uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Ravi to the Triangle area. Well, Peng, thank you very much for the kind introduction and uh, also thank you for uh, inviting me and giving me this opportunity to talk to you and also to think about what I should say. So, you know, <laughs> that's a rare, uh, well, that's a valuable opportunity, let me put it that way. Uh, we academics are so often caught up in the nitty gritty details of what we are doing in proposal deadlines, publication deadlines, student defenses and all that sort of thing. Uh, not to mention university politics, but uh, it, it's, a, it's a rare treat to be able to have an open uh, canvas to kind of prepare a talk and uh, say things that are not otherwise feasible to say in publications and presentations. And uh, I have uh, titled the talk as the Data and Application Security and Privacy Challenge. Uh, this is the name of a conference that we created last year, the ACM Conference on Data and Application Security and Privacy, a long name. Uh, it's uh, going to be uh, held uh, the second time in February in San Antonio. Uh, the papers are under review, so it's too late for this year. I know uh, some of, there have been submissions from uh, at least NCSU. And um, uh, anyway, uh, I'd invite you to come and join us there. Uh, really, in some sense, the topic is about the challenge of cybersecurity. And uh, the data and application security and privacy part of it is uh, perhaps part of the solution. That if we really need to address cybersecurity effectively, then uh, we cannot ignore uh, data and application layer. And maybe, not only cannot ignore, but that's what needs to be the driver in many ways. So that's, all, that's, you know, in a nutshell, the message and the logic behind the title. Now I'd like to begin by uh, talking about the ATM paradox. The paradox is in quotes. It's not uh, a mathematical paradox by any means or a logical paradox. But, you know, uh, it is something that uh, has been troubling me for some time. Uh, and I keep bringing up the ATM network as my uh, uh, sort of canonical example. So I would claim that the automatic teller machine network is pretty secure. It's not perfectly secure, uh, but secure enough, and they've done a good job generally. And it's uh, global in scope and rapidly growing. And I don't think um, most any, I have found very few people who disagree with these claims. So I'm not going to say nobody will disagree, but it's uh, only some uh, real extremists who will disagree with this statement. Of course, we could do better. I don't deny that. But as an empirical fact, it is a successful network. It's pretty secure and it's growing. Uh, the next three things are what I regard as uh, problematic for cybersecurity research and practice. Uh, and these are somewhat uh, judgmental, especially the first one. Because I do not think that the kind of cybersecurity 
education and uh, training that we are doing in academia and in industry. So it's not just academia, although I focused on that here, uh, would lead us to design this kind of a network. Okay? We are not really teaching the kind of thinking and design skills that would uh, lead to the design of such a network. In fact, I'll make a stronger statement that if we actually gave this as a problem to say the top consulting companies in the country, they would probably come out with the mess rather than what we have. So, you know, uh, that's a judgmental statement. Uh, the second uh, statement that we are not studying the ATM network as a success story in cybersecurity, I think uh, the students here should be able to confirm that statement. Uh, how many of your professors have brought this up as a success story? Uh, let me have a show of hands. I do not think I'm going to see any because uh, it is not classically regarded as a success story. The profession does not view it as a success story. We just ignore it. And if we talk about it, it's about the weaknesses that are still there, uh, that are there. We know they are there because nothing can be perfectly secure. But we tend to kind of focus on the uh, sensational weakness kind of stories instead of focusing on the success. And it really is a success story, and we should talk about it as a success. And then the third point, that it's uh, actually missing some technologies that are generally touted by academia. and. Uh, highly regarded in the research community. And I'll mention uh, two of the central ones. One is basically this automatic tailor machine network works without any public key cryptography in it. It's based entirely on symmetric cryptography as opposed to asymmetric cryptography. And those of you, again, who have taken a security course have probably been taught that uh, asymmetric is, the key, is crucial to actually deploying large scale systems. And this one is pretty large scale. And it deals with actual cash, hard physical cash. So, uh, you know, we have a counter example right here of a symmetric key system that's pretty scalable and uh, securing something of real value, money. Uh, and the second one is uh, there, are, there is a distinct lack of anonymity or privacy mechanisms in it. In fact, to the contrary, uh, there's a pretty strong tracking of uh, what all went on. And if you withdraw money from uh, an account from an ATM in a uh, city somewhere abroad, it's going to get recorded as such and uh, tracked as such. Basically. So. I'm taking a system view of it. So, you know, it doesn't matter if it's software or people or processes. At the end of the day, there is overall security or not. Because there's, you know, Every month or two, there's articles about people attaching uh, readers to the front of the ATMs or being forced at gunpoint up to withdraw money. And well, in Texas, they actually took a backhoe and took the machine out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, <that's, laughs> so all kinds of things have happened. Uh, but, you know, uh, uh, yes, it's not perfect. Question about it. I just didn't know where there was. And this. actually, the strongest statement is we don't want to make it perfect. That, that really is the intent of this uh, little example here. And uh, maybe we can come back to this point later. Uh, you know, if, if, if I start getting derailed by questions early in my talk, I'm going to be stuck on the first three slides. I'm not going to get beyond it. That I can guarantee you. Because my slides are intended to provoke. So just take them in that spirit. Uh, hopefully, we will have time for questions. Um, and, you know, the, the last point that there are sort of similar situations with online banking and e-commerce. Uh, many of these applications, uh, which we are now very uh, familiar with and most of us use on a very regular basis, uh, have these attributes. They are pretty secure. Uh, they are pretty uh, widespread. They are not perfect. We can improve them and so on. But we don't look at them as success cases. And we don't actually realize uh, the simplicity of the security technology being used and the lack of you know, sophistication in the mechanisms. And still, we are getting reasonably secure. That's, that's the real mess. Uh, I'm going to make some general comments about the status of uh, cybersecurity today. 
uh, it's pretty clear that cyber systems have evolved very much. Uh, many of you in the room are pretty young, but even in your young lives, you have seen a lot of change. And some of us, people who are a little bit older, have seen a lot more change. And we are going to see a lot more. Uh, this is just the beginning. Uh, there is a lot coming down the pipe. And we, you know, you are all going to contribute and make it happen. Uh, the second one, that cyber attacks and attackers have also evolved. Definitely, there's a level of sophistication and criminalization, professionalization, appearance of nation state actors, uh, appearance of uh, saboteurs, maybe even terrorists. Although the terrorist one has not yet been manifested in uh, real life incidents. And uh, the side note I'm just making uh, as a comment uh, we are. Mostly in this talk, I'm going to focus on the defensive posture, but you know, the United States has declared that it is in the cyber uh, uh, warfare game, uh, not just from a defensive posture, but also from an attack posture. So that, that is something which uh, probably has been going on for some time, but is now openly declared by the U United States government. So not all attacks are bad. If your side is doing the attack, it's probably good. <laughs> but you know, for the most part, when you're talking about the commercial world, uh, the attacks are pretty much off. You, you know, you, you, it, it's not a sensible thing for a business to attack uh, in cyberspace. So uh, again, that's that's just a side note. I don't want to get uh, too distracted by that. And uh, you know, cybersecurity goals have also evolved. And yeah, these goals have been primarily. Uh, sort of uh, looked at from a defensive point of view, not from an offensive point of view. So there, there's a whole uh, theory and practice of cyber attack that needs to be developed, and will will get developed over time. But you know, we have gone from computer security to information security to information assurance and mission assurance. And I'm not going to kind of take uh, you through these steps, uh, but uh, you know, the key uh, attribute of mission assurance is the recognition that you need to be, uh, let, let me give it to you by example. Uh, there was a time when if you found that your network had been compromised, you would shut it down, disconnect it from the rest of the internet or the rest of other networks that it was connected to, and you would try to clean it out and only then reconnect. But that no longer works because uh, you cannot afford to shut down your operations for that period of time. And at the, on the other side, you have no way of guaranteeing that you are completely clean inside. Uh, so there is this notion that there is an advanced, persistent insider in your network all the time uh, who is an attacker. Okay? So we have to be, be able to figure out how to uh, carry out our mission and our operations even in the presence of compromised pieces of our uh, information so that, that's a pretty significant change. Part of it is uh, just a recognition that the attacker can be so uh, stealthy that we don't know they are in there. And they can be in there for a very long time. And, uh, we, and uh, the, the other part of it is that you know, it's at the end of the day, it's not the information that's really important. It's the uh, overall uh, uh, mission that's much more important. So if your planes still fly, even if the information has been uh, compromised somewhat, it's still OK overall. Uh, and then if you look at the status of cybersecurity research, uh, I think we have to say we have not done that good a job. Uh, the cybersecurity research, and to some degree practice also, although my focus here is on the research, uh, is kind of falling behind. We are losing ground. Our evolution is glacial in comparison with the evolution of cyber technology. And uh, you know, this is going on, although we have some very, very innovative people and there's a good amount of funding in this area relative to many other areas of uh, computer science. Uh, and uh, you know, there's been a recognition now, at least for the past five, six years, if not longer, that we need to do something radically different, something game changing. And uh, yet, we are kind of um, not uh, being able to do it. So we, we, we need to do something different. I think that's, that's the main conclusion. And uh, you know, we, we need to figure out how to remain relevant to the real world. And uh, maybe uh, 
this is not a problem just for computer security. Maybe it's a bigger problem for computer science. Uh, you know, in, in many ways, industry has been much more dynamic than academia. And uh, as long as our graduates get jobs, I guess we don't have to worry too much about uh, fixing academia's problems. So, <laughs> so I mean, you know, uh, one, one good thing about being in this general field is uh, there are jobs out there. So, but anyway, we need to do something different. And I'll just give you some rough analogies. They are by no means uh, meant to be, uh, I, you know, uh, it's the spirit of the uh, analogy that's important. Uh, think about software engineering versus programming. And think about, you know, logical data models like entity relationship versus data structures such as B-trees. Now, not, not to say that programming is unimportant or that data structures like B-trees are unimportant. But you know, you, you, you can't just get stuck there. You have to move on to the next uh, bigger thing. And uh, you know, in, in security, we are kind of on the right-hand side. And we need to develop something on the left-hand side. And do I call it security engineering? Do I call it something else? Right now, we don't even have a good name for it. <laughs> so, uh, but we need to think in that direction. So the, the next few slides are going to give you my uh, 100,000 foot characterization of, uh, you know, what is essential in cybersecurity and what, what is it that we need to somehow incorporate into our research and uh, teaching disciplines, okay? So uh, I have about three, four, five slides. I forget the exact count. But the first one, is, it's all about trade-offs. It's never about absolutes. And, uh, you know, on, on one hand, uh, cyber is a big driver for productivity increases. And uh, traditionally uh, and repeatedly, uh, every advance in uh, cyber has come about as saying, hey, let's get it done. We'll figure out how to uh, secure it later. And, uh, you know, it's been done with the internet. It's been done with wireless. It's been done with e-commerce and so on. It, it just happens repeatedly. And, uh, you know, on the other hand, uh, this argument that let's not build it has usually never worked because, uh, you know, once it gets built, it's too attractive for people. And uh, let's try to make it super secure from the beginning hasn't worked because it's not easy to say what security should be without having a concrete system in front of you. And if you don't know what's going to be the, you know, it's very difficult to predict how a system is going to actually get traction uh, in the marketplace and so on. So it, it, you can come up with hypotheticals, but attempts to kind of come up with security standards and technologies before uh, traction of technology have not generally succeeded. And a good, good example of that is public key infrastructure. A lot of that stuff was invented much before the internet came into play, and uh, it was all ready. And uh, it was adopted by the internet standard bodies. You know, you think about PKs. Uh, they generated volumes of uh, uh, standards uh, RFCs. And yet, at the end of the day, there is uh, just very little of that that's actually being used on the internet. So, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's not easy to uh, do all the security in advance. Um, and then, uh, you know, compliance and regulations and so on also are um, often half-brained and they don't really. Uh, so wh what are we going to do between this drive towards productivity and the need for security? We've got to find some sweet spot somewhere in the middle that uh, balances all of these things in some nice way. Maybe not optimal, but at least a nice uh, usable way. And we don't know how to find these sweet spots. That's, that's one of the fundamental problems of our field. And we don't often think about our problems in this way. Because we, we you know, as security researchers, we often want the um, tightest and the best security. And we don't want to sort of deal with this business of trade-offs. Okay. Uh, the second one, uh, security tends to be a tech-heavy field. There are tech-light things you can do. You can twist people's arms and, you know, educate your users not to go to, you know, not to uh, click on strange links that come across in their email and uh, so on. But at the end of the day, 
you know, that's only going to catch the first level of attacks. The real uh, stealthy attacks uh, are, you know, already on the web. Once we have put in some protections against phishing, and we have increased our uh, the uh, effectiveness of our spam filters, uh, you've seen the appearance of drive-by downloads. Now, you know, you, you did nothing wrong. You went to a website. The website was legitimate. You had legitimate reason to be there. But it had gotten penetrated. And there's a malware sitting there, which is going to download onto your machine through no fault of your own. Okay, You followed all the advice. And yet, because there was a problem on the other side, you still get malware coming onto your machine. So there are many, many vectors of getting malware on your machine. And just, yeah, surely the users, you know, if you go back to the ATM example, uh, we are not supposed to write our PIN number on the card. Uh, and most people don't because there's only a four digit PIN and, you know, it's pretty, nobody forces you to change it every month. So it kind of remains constant for a very long time and it becomes part of your uh, <laughs> hardwired memory. But, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not saying that tech light is not required. It is required. But at the end of the day, most of security is going to be pretty tech heavy. Uh, it's cryptographic algorithms, there's uh, operating systems, uh, uh, monitoring, and uh, there's, you know, breaching, there's uh, virtual uh, machine monitors, there's cryptographic protocols, uh, public key, uh, secret key, private key, all kinds of good stuff. It's, it's, it's got to be tech heavy. But uh, in our fascination with tech heavy as engineers and scientists, we often forget that at the end of the day, there are customers, there are real people who are using this stuff. And we, we don't have enough of the high touch aspects of cybersecurity. So we got to move it to a field that's not just high tech. It has to be high tech. So I'm not going to abandon that goal. But it also has to be high touch in a way that uh, we do things so that they are acceptable to human beings and they actually get traction with uh, the real people and consumers. So that's the second uh, characteristic. The third characteristic is that uh, there is this uh, distinction. Uh, it's not a formal distinction that we have yet made in the field. So I'm just throwing it out as an informal idea here. But you have microsecurity versus macro security. So at the micro security level, yeah, I have my own PC. I'll put a virus uh, uh, program on it. I'll uh, make sure it gets the updates. I mean, you know, that's. As a savvy user, I'm going to do some things to keep my own PC uh, in clean shape, but it can still get penetrated. They can still, it can still uh, become part of a much larger botnet and so on. So at the micro, at the macro level, uh, the security risks that are present at the micro level can aggregate and uh, amplify. So when, when we think about uh, aggregation of security problems, especially when we think about it at the national security level, uh, things that are perfectly rational at the micro security level can get out of hand at the macro level. So we, we, we kind of have to come up with this calculus. And uh, uh, so far as I know, uh, we, we're not really thinking in this, uh, this mode uh, that, you know, how, how, how do we, incentivize micro security behavior so that it kind of aggregates into sensible macro security uh, uh, properties of the system. And um, you know, the, the lot, lot of individual firms, a lot of individual human beings uh, are doing fairly uh, rational things at the micro security level. But at the macro security level, we are uh, getting pretty major problems. And the botnet is a prime example of that sort of thing. Uh, the uh, perception and reality problem in uh, cybersecurity, uh, it's not easy to figure out how much security you're actually getting. And uh, very often, uh, the feeling about the perception of security is more than the reality of security. So, uh, you know, you would expect that if, if perception and reality were perfectly matched, you would get a, uh, a perfect diagonal uh, line over there. But typically, the perception is going to be more than the reality. And uh, 
somehow uh, and, and that affects uh, buying decisions, that affects deployment decisions. Um, and uh, you know, uh, to some degree, the recent breach of RSA, where their secure ID token was compromised in a massive way because they lost the master secret key. Uh, it's all symmetric key technology. Uh, they lost very important master secret key uh, because of a penetration. And that kind of cascaded across a lot of the world. And uh, you know, there is alternate technology available that wouldn't have had to rely on a single uh, master secret key. Uh, in particular, there's asymmetric key technology available uh, to achieve the same kinds of results that RSA secure ID token was doing. But somehow we were kind of stuck there. And, um, you know, the. Uh, so, so, how do you uh, make the buyers of security, their perception of the security, somehow closely related to the reality that the security is delivering? Because uh, the vendors are always going to try to get the perception above that line. And deliver below the line. <laughs> and uh, how do you uh, get people to invest in security? So, you know, in, in, in some sense, to me, these four, five, six problems are the sort of characteristic, real characteristic problems of cybersecurity. If we don't address these problems, uh, it's going to be very difficult for us to make. So uh, how do you get anyone to buy into increasing their security while at the same time telling them that, hey, you're still insecure? And, you're, you, you, and, and you can't get rid of that insecurity. So that's a very, very hard sell. And uh, you know, as a consequence, the field kind of, uh, uh, Gene Sudik once put it as, you know, security research is about uh, fairy tales. We, we invent a monster, we, we, as you know, we kind of give the monster some magical powers, and then we find the perfect weapon with which to kind of kill that particular monster. And then we invent another one and kill that one and so on. So, you know, uh, are we playing fairy tales? Are we dealing with some real problems? And in the end, you know, what are the real monsters out there? Well, there's a lot of monsters. Which ones should we be chasing? We really don't know which ones we should be chasing. chasing. So you know, uh, if, if you if you change the uh, viewpoint and say, as a buyer of tech, uh, security technology, what should I be doing? Well, you should certainly not be susceptible to known attacks that have taken place. You should safeguard against those. And most people do that because once you have known attacks, you have signatures for them, you have ways of recognizing them, and you have a justification for spending to protect against. But that's very backward looking. So what should you then do? Maybe you should try to be ahead a little bit, not just fix the attacks that have happened, try to predict how the attacks will escalate, and try to get ahead of the curve a little bit. Could be a logical thing to do. Mitigate some, you know, they have not yet been seen, but we, we can predict they will happen. So spear phishing, well, we can predict it will happen at some point. Now it's, now it's happened already. Uh, and then uh, maybe another strategy is to look at you know what is the most sort of advanced attack that could take place, and let's try to get to get, uh, get that one, uh, prevent against that one. Because if we can stop that one, we can stop all the weaker attacks. Well, these ultimate attacks are you know they're, they're almost countless and infinite. So wh where are you going to stop, and how far are you going to go, and are you going to get so absorbed in trying to protect against the ultimate attack that you kind of ignore much uh, simpler attacks. So, you know, we, we don't know how to address these questions. Really, that's my point. Uh, so in any of these things that I have raised here, uh, most of our problem is that we are not uh, trying to address these kinds of questions. And uh, therefore, it's not surprising that we don't know how to address these kinds of questions. And unless we try to address them, we're going to kind of be stuck in this present mode of pretty sorry state of affairs in terms of uh, uh, the relevance of security research to security reality. So it is our uh, challenge to develop a scientific discipline that can address these kinds of challenges and that can be meaningfully taught in curriculum in universities at all levels. And uh, you know, 
I am going to declare that uh, you will succeed. So, <laughs> uh, because the push of cyber technology is very strong. We need cyber to improve productivity and efficiency in almost every aspect of human operation. Transportation systems, health systems, energy systems, you name it. You know, cyber is going to have to be a major component of uh, improving productivity and efficiency. And, uh, you know, we can't uh, afford to be doing that without injecting appropriate security. So, uh, sort of cast it in a slightly different way. Uh, what are the driving principles as we try to develop such a scientific uh, digital? Uh, they are related to the characteristics that I laid out earlier. I'm just going to put them in a, a slightly different form. So the first one is insecurity is inevitable. Okay. So if you think you're going to be able to get rid of insecurity completely, uh, it's not going to happen. And I, I've put an analogy there with human life and with the medical professions, uh, you know, eventually we are all going to fall apart, okay? So, <laughs> uh, deterioration is inevitable, insecurity is inevitable. Second point, we still can justify investing in security. And, you know, think about medical care. We know we are all going to die, but that doesn't mean we don't try to fix ourselves while we are, <laughs> uh, while we are here. And we don't try to partially fix ourselves. And in, in, in an ultimate sense, we, we cannot fix ourselves until we can fix death. But we don't look to that as our ultimate solution because uh, there are many, many other fixes that we can benefit. Okay. Uh, what would be the equivalent thing in security? And then uh, the fact that too much security can be counterproductive. This is uh, pro probably the hardest thing for security professionals to accept that uh, too much security can be counterproductive because uh, the uh, general drive is we can always do better and if we can do better, let's try to do better. But, you know, uh, it, if you think about medical care, too much medical care can be bad. So it's the same thing with security. If you try to over secure the ATM network, you may destroy the entire business or you may slow down the adoption of the entire business. Same thing with e-commerce. If you try to make it too hard for consumers to do, it may just evaporate, or it may never have caught on. And, uh, you know, how can we, uh, in advance, determine what is the right amount of security for e-commerce? Uh, we really have to do it almost concurrent with the deployment and rollout of e-commerce. It's very hard to do everything in advance. And we have to continue making adjustments as things get rolled out. So, you know, if you look at the uh, academic literature, there are a lot of papers on electronic cash. There are a lot of papers on electronic payments. Even the credit card industry tried to come up with standards uh, to actually have smart card readers and uh, not depend so much uh, on just the credit card number. Uh, but after all of those things played out, uh, which happened in the last uh, 15 years or so, it's not that long, uh, uh, you know, what are we doing today? Our uh, protection for credit cards on the internet has come down to the credit card issuers requiring the merchants to have payment card industry standards implemented by self-attestation. The merchants simply say, we are compliant, and we got it judged by a third party, and we are compliant, we are done. Visa doesn't go and check for that. And, uh, you know, it includes things like they don't store the credit card numbers without encryption and so on. And then the, uh, the CVV number that you are required to provide every time you make a credit card purchase online, uh, because that CVV number is not stored. That, that's a little additional factor that you put in. Now, you know, could we have predicted that this is where industry would end up 15 years ago? No, because industry itself was trying to go in the smart card direction, but they ended up in a totally different position. So, you know, we cannot legislate things in advance always. And uh, nonetheless, we seem to be able to kind of blunder our way at least in large-scale consumer-type uh, deployments of e-commerce uh, in a fairly uh, safe and secure situation. So, 
uh, I'm, uh, you know, perhaps uh, running around a little bit in circles here. But if I had to sum up everything that I said, uh, I believe that this is how I would do it. That the key question is how can we be secure while being insecure? Okay, and that sounds silly because, you know, that it's A and not A. I mean, how does that work? Well, clearly, secure has to have two different meanings in these two instances. That's the only way it can work. But it is the, to me, this is the right way to formulate the question rather than asking, how can we be secure? Because if you say, how, how can we be secure, you're kind of uh, de-emphasizing the fact that you, you, you're going to be secure and insecure at the same time. And that's uh, something that needs to be explicitly recognized by the community. And this is a hard thing to do. Uh, so that's good. Because uh, if it's hard, then maybe there's some interesting work to be done. And uh, we need to kind of uh, orient our research towards answering this you know, sort of big question. And um, how much security is appropriate? Well, sometimes you do want a lot of security. And I was, uh, you know, as I was thinking about uh, what, what I would be saying in this talk, uh, do we, if, if we say that the ATM network is a good example of a secure but insecure system, and I believe, I've, I hope I've convinced all of you that that is the case. Uh, but it's secure, but, you know, it's patently insecure at the same time. All right? So it, it, it's got these two characteristics of being secure and insecure on a daily basis. Uh, and, you know, we are still saying that, that that's okay, that's a success or at least I'm saying it now. But how about systems at the other end where you really don't want any insecurity at all or a very, very tiny sliver of possible insecurity? Uh, so I was thinking about, you know, what would be uh, good, good examples of successful systems in that arena. And uh, one I came up with is the president's nuclear football that he carries around with him so that you know, he doesn't carry it. He has people carrying it for him. But that's what's going to be used to uh, launch uh, either a nuclear attack or a nuclear retaliation, depending on uh, what the circumstances are. And uh, you think there's a cyber component to that? Yeah, there pretty much is a cyber component. Otherwise, he's anywhere in the world and able to do this. It's not happening without cyber behind it. Uh, is it uh, secure? Well, we've lived for 50 years with it. That's half a century. It's not too bad uh, in the sense that, you know, we didn't see uh, an attack uh, uh, happening without the president. Well, the, no president has done an attack, and nobody has forced the president to do an attack or fooled the football to do it. Uh, is it successful uh, in actually carrying out an attack when you want to? That hasn't been tested. But, you know, that's probably a good thing it hasn't been tested. So, you know, I, I would say that, I mean, that, that's an example to me of a system that is successful in that security. And that is the kind of system for which you want that level of security. And, uh, yeah, there are others, but, you know, to me, this is a good example of, if, if you're just saying that you, you, you know, some proof point that this is achieved. Okay. And um, they've done it. So far, it's successful. And uh, the secret formula for Coca-Cola, probably even older. Uh, you say, okay, that's a pretty easy one. They didn't put it on the internet anywhere. They kept it in a safe. But there's no cyber component to what they do with it. I mean, ultimately, that secret formula has to be turned into a physical product. It has to be manufactured, not in one place. It has to be at least used in uh, bottling plants all over the world. That's a pretty massive operation. And surely somewhere in the plants there's cyber, and increasingly more and more cyber. So I, I, I'm not so, you know, it's not as compelling a case as the president's nuclear football, but uh, nonetheless it is a, uh, I believe, a candidate for saying that this thing has been kept pretty secure, and uh, they have a lot of the same problems. They can't just keep it in a safe and forget about it. They got to keep it secure while using it. And wherever they are using it, there is a cyber component, whether you like it or not. And over time, there's going to be more and more of a cyber component in these things. So keeping very high value industrial secrets while letting them being used 
in a context which is cyber dominant dominated is going to be a uh, uh, well we have one success story this is the term of the person okay. uh, so why is the atm system okay uh, the main point i want to get from this uh, slide is that we cannot secure these kinds of systems without considering the applicants. So, the ATM system works because they have stop loss, they have an audit trail, they are willing to tolerate some amount of retail loss, they are scared about wholesale loss and so on. Okay? And yes, all of these things have been briefed. There are instances where all of these things have been briefed, but there are some principles that uh, could be reused in other areas. The actual degree and the actual way in which you deploy these things are application dependent. So, somehow they came up with numbers to say that this is a reasonable amount of withdrawal per withdrawal per day. Uh, sometimes the amount of money you can withdraw depends upon the location of the uh, ATM. If you are in a shady area of town, it will be a lesser amount that you can withdraw than if you are if you are at a bank ATM versus an ATM which is in a store in a not so good neighborhood, they will let you withdraw different amounts of money, okay, and uh, so on. So they've come up with some mechanics for doing this. Some of the general principles are generalizable, but the actual way in which you deploy it is very much application dependent. And the fine tuning is application dependent. And I've already talked about the technical surprises of uh, the simplicity of the security technology being used. Uh, uh, let me uh, uh, sort of turn to the uh, kind of research we have been pursuing. Uh, well, me and my team have been pursuing first at George Mason and now at uh, UTSA. Uh, I've uh, come to this viewpoint that a useful way to classify security uh, research is uh, this picture over here. We have foundations and foundations give us building blocks for security. So an example of that would be symmetric cryptography. Uh, another example would be asymmetric cryptography. Another example would be uh, cryptographic protocols. Uh, memory protection techniques in an operating system, intrusion detection and so on. So, there are lots of building blocks and uh, there is a, you know, some of them are grounded in theory, uh, some of them are more uh, pragmatic and, uh, you know, uh, do not have that much theory behind them. So, there is a mix of building blocks, some with more theoretical grounding, others with less. Uh, but these are all building blocks at the end of the day. And uh, you need to kind of put up uh, systems using these building blocks. And when you are trying to put systems together, you can take either an application centric view. And the application centric view is uh, you have to focus on the uh, security requirements of that particular application and try to find the sweet spot. Again, we are, we are in the sweet spot business. Um, Try to think about the micro security versus macro security, all those things that I kind of enumerated earlier. And uh, the, as we go forward, the nature of these applications is going to change dramatically. So, in the past, a lot of these uh, applications were enterprise centric, payroll, inventory control, um, accounting, and so on. I mean, that was the first round of. Uh, automation in uh, IT. Uh, with the appearance of the internet, we started getting business to consumer applications. That is your online banking, e-commerce. They have pretty much been taken care of at this point. They are not, nothing is ever done forever, but both online banking and e-commerce, we are kind of okay at this point. We can keep improving. But their level of security and uh, so on is roughly equal to what the ATM network is giving you. Not terribly uh, worse than that. And uh, so, you know, if we judge the ATM network to be pretty good, these are all pretty good. Uh, the applications that are emerging are the ones that are going to be interesting from a research point of view. 
So, what does it mean to secure a social network? We do not even know what it means to secure a network. I mean, after all, a social network is there to share information. And the user to whom that network pertains, to whom that information pertains, should have some control over it and some uh, assurance that the sharing is being done as intended by the user. And, uh, you know, at the same time, uh, we, we do not want to say that everyone is in their own island and there is no sharing. So, the definition of what security means in a social network is somewhat amorphous. When you look at other social computing applications that people are contemplating, what does security mean in it? Uh, when you think about uh, secure information sharing, now I want to share information with you, but I still want to control what you can do with it. So, it is kind of almost. Uh, a paradoxical kind of requirement. I want to share information with you, but I do not want you to have freedom to share it entirely with other people. So, how, how do we actually make those kinds of requirements precise and uh, what do we, how do we translate them into mechanisms that can enforce um, uh, these kinds of things. So, the, the, the anticipation is that we are going to have a lot of interesting applications developing in cyberspace. I doubt if anyone will dispute that statement. And the uh, security requirements of those are going to be a little bit different than the classic enterprise and business to consumer applications that we kind of dealt with already. So, when I talk about application centric, it is not so much in the enterprise domain or in the business to consumer domain. It is uh, more in these uh, emerging applications where there are multiple parties involved, each one with different objectives. Okay. So, I believe there is an interesting uh, bunch of research to be done there uh, and that is part of the reason for the creation of Codaspi as a sort of forum to encourage this kind of work. Uh, when we talk about technology centric, uh, every new technology kind of uh, introduces the same old security problems in a new kind of setting, but it also introduces new security problems. So, you have wireless, uh, that is kind of uh, not new anymore, but when uh, wireless LANs came out, it was, you know, in initially they were all insecure and the initial standards were insecure. So, even though the standards bodies tried to inject security into them, they kind of uh, did not get it right. And, uh, uh, you know, it is a little bit interesting uh, fact that uh, when um, the original IEEE proposals were found insecure by cryptographers. And they said, you know, look, this proposal has been out there for a while. How come you guys did not find it before it became a standard? And, you know, said there is no fame in finding it before it became a standard. So, we had to wait till it became a standard to make it worthwhile to <laughs> spend our. <laughs> now, I think people have learned a lesson from that and said, okay. You know, there, there's some fame in looking at it before, also. So you don't have to wait for something to become a standard, or don't don't adopt something as a standard without getting some serious cryptographer to look at it. It involves cryptography, and you're declaring it a standard. Either pay the guy, or make sure that you have somebody on your team who's willing to put in the effort for free. So uh, today we have the cloud, and we have the smart grid. These are sort of two major technology centric kind of areas. I do not know the smart grid you could classify as application centric or technology centric. Um, I, I tend to classify it in the technology centric area because, you know, first you have to roll out a smart grid and on top of that you are going to develop applications. So, you know, it is kind of a platform more than an application by itself. Uh, it is the same thing with cloud computing. As we roll out cloud computing, there are issues about securing cloud computing and then there are issues about securing applications that use cloud computing. So, again I would put cloud computing as a technology centric kind of thing and who, who knows what the next technology will be. Uh, and then there is attack centric. So, in, in, a, in a lot of security work and in, in uh, until recently in my own research, we never really looked at attacks. It was sort of okay, you know, 
we have to worry about them, let the intrusion detection people do it, or let, uh, uh, let the vulnerability analysis people do it. But over time, uh, you know, it, it's going to be harder and harder for us to uh, effectively deploy system level solutions without taking uh, some um, aspects of attack into consideration. So we kind of have to do all these three things and somehow integrate them. And uh, you know, before we can talk about having a unified field, a uh, unified kind of approach to cybersecurity, I think we still have to make progress in these three uh, uh, areas before we can. At the end of the day, you want to have a unified so that may be premature to aim for. Uh, most of our research is stuck on the foundations and building top down. And we need, you know, that's the analogy of moving from programming to software engineering. Right? And uh, we, we uh, in our own research, we've been adopting this sort of divide and conquer approach that uh, you develop models at three distinct layers or levels, whatever you want to call them. Uh, there are policy models where you take highly idealized view of the system. Don't worry about the nitty gritty details about distribution and enforcement and weakness in the operating system and latency and uh, you know delays and revocation um, and delay. So just assume everything is super, you know, all the information you need to make your security decisions is available to you and then what decision to make. So you're really focusing on the uh, pure policy aspects of the question. You're not worried about the mechanics of how you get that information in the right place and how old it might be by the time it gets to you. Okay? Because in reality, a lot of the security decisions you're going to have to make are going to be based on somewhat outdated information. You cannot have all your information up to date all the time. If nothing else, you're going to rely on caching. Um, if, you, if you're disconnected for a period, what are you going to do? If you're, uh, you know, in the limit, your latency is still a few milliseconds or you know, microseconds. So you, you can't eliminate latency completely. And as a practical matter, you probably want to tolerate minutes or even days of latency in some systems, not all, not in the nuclear football. But in the ATM, maybe a little bit of latency is okay. And then um, you, you have to come down to very nitty gritty details about specific protocols, specific algorithms, and so on. So I'll, I'll just illustrate this very quickly with uh, role-based access control. Uh, I'm not going to walk you through the role-based access control idea. It's a very, very simple idea. So I'm not, I won't go through all the details of this model. <clears throat> but the notion is that users are assigned roles and then based on those roles, they are actually able to get uh, permission to do things. And we have this uh, RBAC 96 model which was published in 1996. We have the NIST model which was published in 2001, became a standard in 2004, uh, kind of based around uh, this idea and uh, you know, it's not addressing the question of how do I know? How do I authenticate the user? How do I know which roles the user is assigned to? How do I know whether this role has sufficient permission to do this uh, function? Okay? It's just saying, okay, let's assume that happens. And what, what are our policies? And there's enough there for us to kind of uh, have to come to some agreement about standards at the policy level. Uh, at the enforcement layer, we can enforce role-based access control in many different ways. I'm going to show you just two of them. So if you have a client server system and, uh, well, I've kind of mixed up client and user, but Alice is on the client and coming to the server to do something and uh, the server needs to know Alice's roles before the uh, server can allow that access or not, or provide that service or not. And the server is responsible for getting information about Alice's roles. Basically, that's what this picture shows. So Alice just says, I'm Alice, and somehow authenticates to the server. 
and then the server says I will figure out whether you have the role to do what you want. Uh, the opposite picture, Alice is responsible for getting a credential that says she has the correct role that she needs in order to do something and then she delivers that credential to the server and gets the, the service. Uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, there are pros and cons of uh, either one of these approaches, but they are clearly uh, uh, distinct and different. And uh, they can support the same uh, policy layer model. So they can support RBAC with hierarchy, RBAC without hierarchy, RBAC with constraints. Doesn't really matter. You can use either one of these two architectures. And, uh, you know, in this case, uh, you need perhaps cryptographic protection of the link between the server and the user role authorization server. But you do not need cryptographic protection of if, if these two servers trust each other, then it is not necessary that I have to give you a signed assertion. I can simply tell you. And if you trust this link because it is cryptographically protected, or because it is in the same back end network which is behind a lot of firewalls so you do not even care to cryptographically protect it. So, you know the protection of this, this connection can come in many different ways and there is no obligation to have cryptographic protection of uh, end to end from server to server. Right? Whereas in this case because this information is coming through the client, you are going to, you cannot trust the client. So, if this, this information needs to be cryptographically protected end to end and uh, you know it is a basic difference in the trust architecture of these two things. So, the point is at the E layer we should not be worrying about any of this stuff, at the E layer we should. And then if you talk about detailed protocols for doing this, is this SSL, is this SSH, is it your own homegrown crypto algorithm, <laughs> those are sort of implementation layer uh, issues. And uh, I have another example here of group based policy, but I will just skip it since we are running a little bit out of time and I will conclude uh, with this. Uh, so, we have tried to come up with an approach to at least addressing the application centric aspect of what I have uh, argued is the space of uh, cyber security research foundations, application centric, technology centric, attack centric. And if you are looking at the application centric point of view, then uh, I would offer this policy enforcement implementation as three layers of abstractions that you need to develop in order to make progress. And, uh, we have found that useful with RBAC. We have found that useful with pretty much any research that we have done. Uh, it does not mean that you have to work at all three layers, but you should be very clear in your mind as to which one you are addressing. To, to solve the full problem, you need to address all this. And I will uh, close with by just putting this conclusion up there. And, uh, I have a little bit of time for some questions. And, uh, uh, if anyone at the remote site would like to ask a question, I will offer that first. Otherwise, I will open it up. Questions, remarks? Yes. So I liked your uh, your building blocks of security, your model there with the three pieces. So one block that one might ask is missing. Uh, why aren't why isn't why isn't people in a block? Uh, <laughs> where where do people fit into this? I guess they would certainly fit in here because I don't see how you can uh, deal with applications without talking. That's a, that's a good point. I mean, do we have any people issues down here? You probably do. So, you know, uh, uh, there have been uh, well, let me just mention a couple of things that could fit in at, at foundations at the people level. So, if you think about complexity of passwords, we, we have some clear indications on the, we, we can do better experiments maybe on uh, what what is acceptable to human beings in terms of uh, 
you know, uh, complexity of passwords that they are asked to remember and enter. It's not just remembering, it's the entering, which is a nuisance. We can ask, uh, we can look at uh, actual practice. Uh, I still find this remarkable. Uh, my ATM password has not changed in guess how many years? It's decades. <laughs> well, that's your fault. It's not my fault. Nobody asked me to change it, and nothing's ever happened. So, you know, and I'm not even sure the process for changing a PIN number is not very convenient either. Okay? So I'd probably have to get a new card and everything. And nobody's forced me to do it. And, you know, it's kind of burnt into my memory. And, you know, I find that to be a pretty remarkable fact that actually, you know, it's been a long time since my PIN was changed. And yet, when I first joined UTSA, Every month they made me change my password. <laughs> now they kind of backed up, backed off to six months, which I appreciate. <laughs> uh, what about some sig uh, fingerprints? Not, not not just literally fingerprints, but you know the iris of the eye or uh, some other part of the body. Uh, would would uh, safeguard the entry into the system, right? If if if, if you get uh, uh, you know if somebody can get your credit card and breaks your arm, you will tell him everything to save your life and uh, you'll go to the uh, uh, ATM card and, uh, and get the money, right? So, uh, but he cannot Yeah, if he's a smart your he, hand there, take well, your eye with him. Uh, I don't know, I've seen James Bond movies where the guy cuts off somebody. <laughs> uses it, so, you know. He can, get, he can get pretty yeah. macabre over here. Uh, why are we sticking with the simple technologies? You know, there is a reason why passwords are effective. Uh, they are low cost. They are uh, almost universally applicable uh, as long as there's some kind of a keyboard available. And uh, they are uh, to, a, to a degree effective. Now, at the same time, clearly, multi-factor authentication is useful. So, you know, it sort of addresses your point too. We can do work in sort of basic uh, human usability as to what is acceptable to human beings, what is, uh, uh, what is viable, what, and so on. I'm not, uh, uh, I, I'm a believer in multi-factor authentication. I'm not so sure that I uh, am a backer of biometrics just because I believe that, uh, you know, it's one thing, you, you can actually change your ATM password. Uh, you're not going to be able to change your fingerprint. So if your fingerprint ever gets compromised in some way uh, that it is usable by somebody else, and it's not going to be uh, easy to retract it. You need plastic surgery or something. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, in, for the nuclear football, yes. I think biometrics is very strongly recommended. But for... Uh, So I have a question about your, your PEI sort of policy enforcement and implementation. Um, so I, I think that's a, that's a reasonable way to architect the system, but in, in my uh, recent thinking of the last few years, I've come to the conclusion that with the, with the policy models, there should, should also be a standard of correctness for the policies themselves. Sure. And I call that, a, and that should also be formal. It doesn't have to be informal. So I think of that as a normative description of the the organization where the policies are to apply. So there's a normative description of, you know, of correctness, you could say, and that's what induces us to adopt you know, one set of policies or another. So yeah, I don't think we disagree on that. Uh, you know, so certainly at uh, any of these uh, formal, uh, formal methods are important. Uh, but, you know, I'm, let me give you the Bell Padula model or the lattice space access model. So the, the uh, overall system policy is it's okay for information to flow from secret to top secret but not from top secret to secret. Yeah, we can formalize this a little bit more but if you start over formalizing up here, I believe you kind of uh, drive it away from the domain of uh, top level decision makers and you know, kind of. So a, 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 lot, a, a lot of that uh, rigor and articulation and so on may actually, in my, in my view, be sort of uh, 
already done here rather than necessarily doing it. You know, because uh, 